In the untamed expanse of the American frontier, where lawlessness often reigned supreme, justice was meted out in the most public and brutal of fashions. Public executions, particularly hangings, became a macabre cornerstone of Wild West society, serving as both a deterrent to would-be criminals and a visceral form of entertainment for the masses. The creaking of the gallows and the sound of a trap door snapping open were as much a part of the western soundscape as the crack of a six-shooter or the thundering of hooves. As the infamous gunfighter Doc Holliday once quipped, there's nothing like a hanging to bring a town together. The practice of public executions in the American West reached its zenith in the late 19th century, with the period between 1870 and 1910 seeing the highest number of recorded hangings. These events were not merely acts of punishment, they were elaborate productions, often drawing crowds from miles around. In 1881, when the notorious outlaw Billy the Kid was scheduled to hang in Lincoln, New Mexico, people traveled for days just to witness the spectacle. Though Billy ultimately cheated the hangman's noose through a daring escape, his near execution exemplified the fervor surrounding these events. Another famous outlaw, Cherokee Bill, faced his execution in Fort Smith, Arkansas, on March 17, 1896. As he stood on the gallows, he was asked if he had any last words. With remarkable coolness, he replied, I came here to die, not to make a speech. The process of a public hanging was a gruesome affair, designed to maximize both the suffering of the condemned and the impact on spectators. Typically, the prisoner would be led to the gallows, often constructed in the town square or a similarly prominent location. A hood would be placed over their head and a noose fitted around their neck. The executioner would then release a trap door beneath the prisoner's feet, leaving them to dangle and slowly suffocate, a process that could take anywhere from a few seconds to several agonizing minutes. One of the most infamous executions of the era took place on March 22, 1882, in Fort Smith, Arkansas. On that day, Judge Isaac Parker, known as the Hanging Judge, ordered the simultaneous execution of six men, Thomas Wyatt, William Leach, George Paget, Daniel Evans, Philip Lincoln, and John Postok. The mass hanging drew a crowd of thousands, with one eyewitness describing the scene as a carnival of death. Judge Parker, who presided over 160 executions during his tenure, embodied the harsh frontier justice of the time, once declaring, I never hanged a man, it is the law. Parker's reputation was so fearsome that one condemned man, James R. Seen, reportedly said before his execution, I would rather face a dozen guns than Judge Parker. The spectacle of these executions often took on a festive air, with towns treating them as social events. Vendors would sell refreshments, photographers would set up to capture the moment for posterity, and children would be hoisted onto their parents' shoulders for a better view. In some cases, such as the hanging of John Millen in Tombstone, Arizona in 1884, special viewing platforms were constructed to accommodate the throngs of spectators. The execution of the Olive Brothers, Ira and Jay, in Minden, Nebraska in 1878, drew a crowd of over 2,000 people, more than 10 times the town's population. Spectators arrived by wagon, horseback, and even special excursion trains to witness the event. Not all executions went smoothly, adding to the grim fascination of the crowds. In 1896, Black Jack Ketchum, a notorious train robber, met a particularly gruesome end in Clayton, New Mexico. When the trapdoor opened, the rope was too long, and the fall decapitated him instantly. His headless body stood upright for several moments before collapsing, an image that haunted witnesses for years to come. In a macabre twist, souvenir hunters scrambled to dip handkerchiefs in Ketchum's blood, and pieces of the rope were sold as keepsakes. This ghoulish souvenir taking was not uncommon. After the 1881 hanging of the infamous bandit queen Belle Starr's husband, Sam Starr in Fort Smith, pieces of the rope were eagerly sought after by the crowd. While Billy the Kid managed to escape his appointment with the gallows, many other famous outlaws were not so fortunate. Tom Horn, a notorious gunman and hired killer, was hanged in Cheyenne, Wyoming on November 20, 1903. 
Horn's execution was notable for its use of the Julian Gallows, an automated hanging machine triggered by the condemned man's own weight on a trap door. As Horn stepped onto the trap door, he reportedly quipped, Hurry up, I've got an appointment in hell at noon and I don't want to be late. Horn's last meal was impressive. He requested a breakfast of bacon, eggs, potatoes, toast, coffee and a Cuban cigar, which he smoked on his way to the gallows. The James Younger Gang, one of the most infamous outlaw groups of the era, saw several of its members meet their end at the gallows. While Jesse James was gunned down rather than hanged, his brother Frank narrowly avoided execution multiple times. However, gang members Jim Cummins and Bill Ryan were both publicly hanged, Cummins in 1888 and Ryan in 1896, their executions drawing massive crowds eager to see the demise of such renowned criminals. Cole Younger, another member of the gang, cheated death and spent 25 years in prison before being paroled. He later joined a Wild West show, proving that even for those who escaped the noose, the spectacle of the Old West continued. Public hangings were not without their critics, even in the rough-and-tumble world of the Wild West. Some saw them as barbaric spectacles that degraded society rather than deterred crime. In 1881, the Rocky Mountain News editorialized, Public executions are relics of a barbarous age and should be abolished. They serve no good purpose and are demoralizing in their tendencies. This sentiment was echoed by some of the era's most famous figures. Mark Twain, who witnessed a public hanging in Nevada in 1864, wrote in his book, Roughing It, I never wish to see another of them. It was awful, too awful for description. Despite such criticisms, public executions continued to be a significant part of frontier justice well into the early 20th century. The last public hanging in the United States took place in Owensboro, Kentucky in 1936, well after the traditional Wild West era had drawn to a close. This execution of a young African-American man named Rainey Bethia drew a crowd of 20,000 and was widely seen as a shameful spectacle helping to push the practice of public executions into obsolescence. Bethea's last words were simple and poignant. God bless you all. I hope you get straightened out. I'll see you all on the other side. Shackles and Sagebrush. The grim saga of Wild West prisons and chain gangs. In the untamed expanse of the American frontier, where lawlessness often reigned supreme, the concept of justice took on a harsh and unforgiving form. The prison systems of the Wild West, if they could be called systems at all, were a far cry from the rehabilitative institutions we know today. They were crucibles of suffering, makeshift hells carved out of the very landscape that had promised freedom and opportunity to so many. One of the most notorious examples of frontier incarceration was the Yuma Territorial Prison, which opened its gates to its first inmate, William Hall, convicted of grand larceny on July 1st, 1876. Perched on a bluff overlooking the Colorado River in Arizona, this prison was a study in contradiction. Its imposing stone walls and iron-barred cells spoke of permanence and security, yet the harsh desert environment surrounding it seemed to mock any notion of civilization. The prison quickly earned the nickname Hell Hole among both inmates and locals, the conditions at Yuma were brutal, to say the least. Prisoners were crammed into cells measuring just 9 by 12 feet, with up to six men sharing this claustrophobic space. The desert heat was merciless, often soaring above 120 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer months. One former inmate, known only as Charlie in prison records, wrote in his memoirs, The very air seemed to burn our lungs, and the iron bars of our cells were too hot to touch. We were not just prisoners of men, but of the relentless sun itself. In 1881, seven prisoners died from heat exhaustion in a single week, leading to the installation of crude ventilation systems. Yet, paradoxically, Yuma Territorial Prison was considered one of the more humane institutions of its time. It boasted a library of over 2,000 books, and prisoners were allowed to take classes and learn trades. This unexpected nod to rehabilitation was the brainchild of the prison's first superintendent, Thomas Gates, who believed that, even in the depths of punishment, 
a man might find the seeds of his own redemption. The prison even had a band, the Yuma Prison Orchestra, which performed for both inmates and the public on holidays. But for every Yuma, there were dozens of makeshift jails and holding pens that defied any notion of humane treatment. In the mining town of Tombstone, Arizona, the local jail was little more than a hole in the ground covered with iron bars. Prisoners were lowered into this pit and left to the mercy of the elements and whatever vermin chose to join them. Wyatt Earp, who served as deputy sheriff of Tombstone in 1880, described it as a place where hope goes to die and only the strong or the mad survive. One infamous inmate, buckskin Frank Leslie, spent three months in this pit in 1889 for murder. Upon his release, he quipped, I've been to hell and back, and hell was more comfortable. In the cattle town of Dodge City, Kansas, the jail was a simple wooden structure that offered little protection from the bitter winter winds or the sweltering summer heat. It was here that the infamous gunslinger Clay Allison found himself incarcerated in 1876. Legend has it that Allison, in a fit of rage or madness, gnawed off his own toe to escape. While the veracity of this tale is questionable, it speaks to the desperate measures prisoners might contemplate to escape their confinement. Bat Masterson, who served as sheriff of Ford County, Kansas, from 1877 to 1879, once said of the Dodge City Jail, I've seen dog kennels with more comfort and dignity. The concept of the chain gang, while not unique to the Wild West, found particularly brutal expression in this unforgiving landscape. In Texas, prisoners were often leased out to private contractors for hard labor, a system that was barely distinguishable from slavery. The infamous Sugarland Prison Farm, established in the 1870s, saw convicts toiling in the sugarcane fields from dawn to dusk, their ankles shackled together with heavy iron chains. By 1883, the state was earning over $85,000 annually from convict leasing, a significant sum at the time. J.B. Wilmoth, a reform-minded journalist who visited Sugarland in 1883, wrote, I saw men whose ankles were raw and bleeding from the chafe of the shackles, whose backs were striped and scarred from the lash. This is not justice, this is vengeance, masquerading as law. His expose in the Galveston Daily News sparked outrage, but led to little immediate change. It wasn't until 1910 that Texas began to phase out the convict leasing system. In the mountains of Colorado, chain gangs were put to work in the silver mines, laboring in dark, dangerous conditions for up to 16 hours a day. The mortality rate was staggering. Records from the Colorado Territorial Correctional Facility in Cannon City show that in 1871 alone, nearly 20% of the prison population died from accidents, disease, or exhaustion. The prison's most famous inmate, Alfred Packer, convicted of cannibalism in 1874, reportedly said upon seeing his first meal in the prison, the potatoes are almost as good as the ones we ate in the mountains. The use of chain gangs served a dual purpose. Not only did it provide cheap labor for the rapidly expanding industries of the West, but it also acted as a powerful deterrent to crime. The sight of shackled men laboring under the watchful eyes of armed guards was a stark reminder of the consequences of running afoul of the law. In 1887, a visitor to the Arizona Territorial Prison in Yuma described the chain gang as a pitiful sight, yet one that might give pause to even the most hardened criminal. Yet, for all its brutality, the chain gang system was not without its critics, even in the hardened West. In 1887, Colorado Governor Alva Adams declared, The leasing of convicts is a blot upon our civilization. It is a system born of avarice and cruelty. His words, however, fell largely on deaf ears, and the practice continued well into the 20th century. It wasn't until 1923 that Texas became the last state to officially abolish convict leasing, though informal practices persisted for years after. The harsh realities of Western prisons and chain gangs gave rise to a unique subculture among the incarcerated. Prison slang from this era reflects the grim humor of those trying to survive in these conditions. A hanging was referred to as a necktie party 
While the prison itself was often called the Stone Hotel, the guards were screws, and to be released was to ride the owl, a reference to leaving under cover of darkness. One particularly colorful term was calaboose cocktail, referring to the often putrid water provided to prisoners. One of the most curious aspects of Wild West incarceration was the phenomenon of the trusty system. Certain prisoners, usually those with longer sentences or special skills, were given positions of responsibility within the prison. These trustees might serve as cooks, clerks, or even armed guards watching over their fellow inmates. This system, while reducing the need for paid staff, also created a complex hierarchy among prisoners and was ripe for abuse. In the Nevada State Prison, established in 1862, trustees were known to run gambling operations and even a rudimentary mail service for other inmates. In the Wyoming Territorial Prison, which opened in 1872, trustees were even allowed to live outside the prison walls in small cabins. One such trustee, a forger named Joseph Seng, used his position to create a thriving moonshine business, selling his illicit spirits to both guards and prisoners alike. When his operation was finally discovered in 1890, the warden reportedly said, I don't know whether to have him shot or offer him a job in administration. Seng's entrepreneurial spirit was not unique. In 1883, two trustees at the Texas State Penitentiary in Huntsville managed to escape after amassing a small fortune running the prison's general store. The Wild West's most famous outlaw, Butch Cassidy, spent 18 months in the Wyoming Territorial Prison from 1894 to 1896 for horse theft. His time there was reportedly marked by good behavior and he became a trustee, working in the prison laundry. Upon his release, Cassidy allegedly said, the thing about a laundry is, there's always a way to clean up your act. He would go on to form the Wild Bunch gang shortly after his release, suggesting that the prison's rehabilitative efforts were not entirely successful. The Apache Ring, employed in New Mexico Territory during the 1880s, was a diabolical invention that turned the simple act of walking into an excruciating ordeal. Prisoners were chained together in a circle, forced to shuffle endlessly without rest or respite. Billy the Kid, who experienced this torment firsthand in 1880 at the Lincoln County Jail, reportedly said, I'd rather dance with death than do another turn in that infernal ring. The punishment could last for days, with exhausted inmates supporting each other to avoid the brutal consequences of falling. Pat Garrett, the sheriff who later shot Billy the Kid, described the Apache Ring as a dance with the devil where the music never stops. The Ring wasn't just a physical torment, it was a psychological one as well. Prisoners were often forced to wear heavy iron collars connected by chains, ensuring that if one man fell, he would drag others down with him. This cruel twist fostered a tense atmosphere of mutual dependence and potential betrayal among the inmates. In 1885, at the territorial prison in Santa Fe, a group of five prisoners endured the Apache Ring for a record-breaking seven days as punishment for an escape attempt. Only three survived the ordeal. In Texas, the water cure took hydration to horrifying extremes. Prisoners were force-fed gallons of water until their stomachs distended painfully, bringing them to the brink of drowning. This technique, used well into the early 1900s, was particularly favored at the Huntsville prison. One anonymous inmate's account from 1893 described it as drowning from the inside out, a baptism in hell's own font. The method was not only used as punishment, but also as a brutal form of interrogation, with prisoners often confessing to crimes they hadn't committed just to stop the torture. The water cure gained notoriety beyond prison walls when it was employed by Texas Rangers in their pursuit of outlaws. In 1889, Ranger James B. Gillette used the technique to extract information from a suspected cattle rustler near El Paso. The incident sparked a public debate about the ethics of law enforcement, with one El Paso Times editorial asking, at what point does the pursuit of justice become injustice itself? Perhaps the most visually striking of these punishments was the jail tree of Laramie, Wyoming. From 1868 to 1876, 
law enforcement in this frontier town used a large cottonwood tree as a makeshift jail. Prisoners were chained to the tree, exposed to the elements and public ridicule. One of its most famous guests was Big Steve Long, a notorious outlaw who spent three days chained to the tree in 1868 before his hanging. Long, defiant to the end, reportedly shouted to the gathering crowd, I'll haunt this tree long after you're all dust. The jail tree became such a landmark that when it was struck by lightning in 1900, the Wyoming State Journal eulogized it as the only jail that never had a prisoner escape. It wasn't just criminals who found themselves bound to the tree. In 1875, a group of drunken cowboys were chained to the tree overnight to sober up, leading one local wag to comment, that tree's seen more stars than an astronomer. The tree's role as a jail ended in 1876 with the construction of a proper jailhouse, but its legend lived on. Pieces of the tree were sold as souvenirs well into the 20th century, with one chunk allegedly making its way to a museum in London as an example of American frontier justice. As the 19th century drew to a close, there were glimmers of reform on the horizon. The establishment of the federal penitentiary at Leavenworth, Kansas in 1895 marked a shift towards more standardized and regulated incarceration. Leavenworth introduced novel concepts such as vocational training and a merit system for prisoners. Yet for many in the Wild West, prison remained a brutal gauntlet where survival, not rehabilitation, was the primary goal. The turn of the century also saw the rise of prison rodeos, a uniquely Western form of entertainment that began in the Texas prison system. The first recorded prison rodeo took place in 1931 at the Texas State Penitentiary in Huntsville, though informal events likely occurred earlier. These rodeos, featuring inmate cowboys, were both a form of recreation for prisoners and a public spectacle that drew thousands of spectators. They represented a strange intersection of punishment and entertainment that would have been unthinkable in earlier decades. In the words of one anonymous prisoner, scratched into the wall of a cell in the old Prescott, Arizona jail, here's to those who've seen the elephant and heard the owl, may God have mercy on our souls, for these stone walls surely won't. It was a fitting epitaph for an era when justice was often as wild and unforgiving as the frontier itself. As we reflect on this dark chapter of American history, we're reminded of the words of Dostoevsky, who wrote, The degree of civilization in a society can be judged by entering its prisons. By this measure, the Wild West was indeed a frontier in more ways than one, struggling to balance the demands of justice with the ideals of human dignity in a land where both were often in short supply. Marked by the West, tales of stockades, whips and searing brands, in the untamed expanse of the American frontier, justice wore a harsh and unforgiving face. The Wild West, a land where law often struggled to keep pace with the rapid tide of settlement, saw the revival of ancient forms of punishment alongside new, brutal innovations. Stockades, whipping posts and branding irons became tools of order, leaving their mark on both the bodies of the condemned and the collective memory of a nation. The stockade, a remnant of colonial times, found new life in the Western Territories. In Tombstone, Arizona, the infamous Boot Hill Graveyard stands as a silent witness to the town's violent past. But few visitors realize that just a stone's throw away once stood a stockade where miscreants were held up to public ridicule. In 1881, a local newspaper, the Tombstone Epitaph, reported that a man named John Slaughter was sentenced to two hours in the stockade for public drunkenness. The editor wryly noted, it is hoped that this novel punishment will have a sobering effect on our more boisterous citizens. Interestingly, this John Slaughter was not to be confused with the famous lawman John Horton Slaughter, who later became sheriff of Cochise County. The stockade in Tombstone was not unique. Similar structures could be found in frontier towns across the West, from Dodge City, Kansas, to Deadwood, South Dakota. Whipping posts, another holdover from earlier times, were a common sight in western towns. In Dodge City, Kansas, known as the wickedest little city in America, a whipping post stood prominently in the town square. Marshal Wyatt Earp, 
who served in Dodge City from 1876 to 1879, is said to have favoured the whipping post for minor offences. According to local law, Earp once remarked, there's nothing like the sting of a good whipping to remind a man of the virtues of good behaviour. This sentiment was echoed by many lawmen of the era, including Bat Masterson, who served alongside Earp in Dodge City. Masterson was quoted as saying, the sound of the lash is sometimes the only language a criminal understands. The territory of New Mexico saw particularly frequent use of the whipping post. In 1887, in the town of Las Vegas, New Mexico, a horse thief named Miguel Sandoval received 39 lashes at the post. The Santa Fe New Mexican reported that the punishment was administered with vigor and the culprit's cries could be heard across the plaza. This public spectacle served not only as punishment, but as a deterrent, with the newspaper noting that such displays of justice will surely give pause to those of criminal inclination. The use of the whipping post in New Mexico was not limited to Las Vegas. In Santa Fe, the territorial capital, records from 1885 show that a man named Jose Domingo Gallegos received 20 lashes for stealing a saddle. The territorial governor at the time, Lionel Allen Sheldon, defended the practice, stating, In this wild country, we must use every tool at our disposal to maintain order. Perhaps the most visceral and permanent form of punishment in the Old West was branding. While primarily associated with marking cattle, the practice was also applied to human beings, particularly those convicted of horse or cattle theft. In Texas, the practice was codified into law. The Penal Code of Texas, adopted in 1856, stipulated that for a first offense of horse theft, the convicted party would be branded with the letter H on their shoulder. A second offence would result in branding with HT on the cheek. This law remained on the books until 1879, when it was finally repealed. During its enforcement, dozens of convicted thieves were branded, including a notorious horse thief named John Wesley Hardin, who received the H brand in 1877 before escaping custody. One of the most notorious cases of criminal branding occurred in Wyoming in 1884. A group of prominent ranchers, frustrated with persistent cattle rustling, formed the Wyoming Stock Growers Association. They hired range detectives who captured a man named Andy Ketchum, accused of stealing cattle. Rather than turn him over to the authorities, they took matters into their own hands. Ketchum was branded on his forehead with the letters HT for horse thief, though he was accused of stealing cattle. This cruel irony was not lost on Ketchum, who reportedly spat out, you fools can't even get your lousy letters right. The incident caused a stir, even in the rough and tumble Wyoming territory. The Cheyenne Daily Leader condemned the action, writing, such barbaric practices have no place in a civilized society, even on the frontier. The practice of branding criminals was not without its critics, even in the rough-and-tumble West. In 1887, Judge Roy Bean, the self-proclaimed Law West of the Pecos, presided over a case in Langtree, Texas, where a young man was convicted of horse theft. When some of the townsfolk called for branding, Bean reportedly said, We ain't in the business of marking men like cattle. A stint in my jail will do just fine. This moment of mercy from the usually harsh Bean, highlights the growing discomfort with such permanent forms of punishment as the West began to settle. Bean's reputation for rough justice makes this instance of leniency all the more noteworthy. As he once famously quipped, it's not the law that matters, it's who's judging the case. In some cases, the threat of branding was used as a form of extrajudicial punishment and intimidation. During the Johnson County War in Wyoming in 1892, a conflict between large cattle barons and smaller ranchers, there were reports of small landowners being threatened with branding if they didn't sell their land and leave the area. One homesteader, Nate Champion, wrote in his diary before being killed by the cattlemen's hired guns, they said they'd brand me like a steer if I didn't clear out. I told them I'd rather die as a man than live as branded cattle. Champion's stand against the cattle barons became a rallying cry for small ranchers throughout the territory. 
His last words, scrawled as his cabin burned around him, read, Goodbye, boys. If I ever see you again, I'll have a story to tell. The use of these harsh physical punishments began to wane as the 19th century drew to a close and more formal systems of law and incarceration took hold in the West. However, their impact on the popular imagination of the Wild West remained strong. In 1902, Owen Wister's seminal Western novel, The Virginian, featured a vivid description of a near lynching where the threat of branding played a key role, showing how these practices had already begun to pass into legend. Wister's novel helped cement the image of the Wild West in the American consciousness, including its harsh forms of justice. As the Virginian himself says in the novel, when you call me that, smile, a line that captures both the politeness and the underlying threat of violence that characterized the era. As the frontier closed and the 20th century dawned, stockades, whipping posts and branding irons gradually disappeared from the landscape of Western justice. Yet their memory lingered, a stark reminder of a time when the law was often as wild as the land it sought to tame. These brutal forms of punishment, born of desperation and a harsh environment, left an indelible mark on the history of the American West, as permanent as the brands once seared into the flesh of those judged beyond redemption. As one old cowhand reflecting on his youth in the 1870s reportedly said, the West was hard on horses, harder on men, but hardest of all on those who crossed the line. The brands and scars told tales that words never could. Rope and Retribution, the dark dance of vigilante justice in the Wild West. In the sprawling, untamed expanse of the American frontier, where the long arm of the law often fell short, justice took on a raw and visceral form. The Wild West, a land of opportunity and lawlessness, gave birth to a breed of rough justice that would leave an indelible mark on American history, vigilantism. In the absence of established law enforcement, ordinary citizens banded together, forming vigilante groups that dispensed swift and often brutal punishment to those they deemed deserving. As the legendary frontiersman Wyatt Earp once remarked, fast is fine, but accuracy is everything. In a gunfight, you need to take your time in a hurry. The Montana Vigilantes, formed in 1863, stand as one of the most notorious examples of frontier justice. In the gold-rich territory of Bannock and Virginia City, a gang of outlaws known as the Innocents, led by Sheriff Henry Plummer, had been terrorizing the populace. The vigilantes, fed up with the reign of terror, took matters into their own hands. On a frigid January night in 1864, they strung up Plummer and two of his deputies from a gallows beam. As Plummer stood on the scaffold, he reportedly pleaded, for God's sake, give me a good drop. The vigilantes were unmoved, and by the end of their campaign, they had hanged 24 men without trial. Their actions were so impactful that the vigilantes' secret password, March 7th, 77, later became the official symbol of the Montana Highway Patrol, a chilling reminder of frontier justice's lasting legacy. The San Francisco Vigilance Committee of 1851 and 1856 provides another stark example of citizen-led justice. In a city rife with corruption and crime, the committee, comprising thousands of citizens, seized control of the city. They conducted trials, hung criminals, and even exiled some undesirables. During their 1856 campaign, they famously lynched two notorious criminals, James Casey and Charles Cora, from the windows of their headquarters. The spectacle drew a crowd of 15,000 onlookers, turning the execution into a public event that rivaled any official hanging. The committee's impact was so profound that it led to the resignation of David Broderick as state senator and played a significant role in reshaping San Francisco's political landscape. As committee member William Tell Coleman stated, we are here not to punish criminals so much as to protect ourselves. Lynchings, the most brutal form of vigilante justice, were not uncommon in the Wild West. These extrajudicial killings often targeted not just criminals, but also racial and ethnic minorities. In 1885, in Rock Springs, Wyoming, a mob of white miners massacred 28 Chinese laborers, 
and drove hundreds more out of town. The event, known as the Rock Springs Massacre, was a grim reminder of the racial tensions that often fueled vigilante actions. Similarly, in 1871, Los Angeles witnessed one of the largest mass lynchings in American history when 18 Chinese men were hanged by a mob of 500 people. This event, known as the Chinese Massacre of 1871, stemmed from a conflict between rival Chinese gangs, but quickly escalated into widespread violence against the Chinese community. The story of Josiah Begol, a suspected horse thief in 1863 Colorado, illustrates the swift and often misguided nature of frontier justice. Begol was lynched by a mob after being accused of stealing horses. As he dangled from the rope, a man rode up on the very horse Begol was accused of stealing, proving his innocence too late. This tragic miscarriage of justice led to the common Western saying, first hang him, then try him. A similar case occurred in 1873 in Texas, where three brothers, William George and Philip Higgins, were lynched for allegedly stealing horses. It was later discovered that they had legally purchased the horses, but the revelation came too late to save their lives. Even well-known figures weren't immune to the threat of lynching. In 1882, Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday narrowly escaped a lynching in Tombstone, Arizona. After the famous gunfight at the OK Corral, a mob of cowboys, seeking vengeance for their fallen comrades, gathered outside the jail where Earp and Holiday were being held. It was only the timely intervention of the town marshal that prevented a lynching. Earp later recounted, The only thing that saved us from being lynched was the fact that our friends made it known that they would shoot the first man that made a move in that direction. This incident underscores how even those on the side of the law could find themselves at the mercy of mob justice. The Lincoln County War of 1878 in New Mexico Territory provides a complex tapestry of vigilantism and personal vendettas. What began as a conflict between two rival business factions escalated into a series of revenge killings and lynchings. The conflict drew in figures like Billy the Kid and Pat Garrett, blurring the lines between lawmen, outlaws and vigilantes. The war culminated in the five-day battle in Lincoln, where vigilantes besieged a house containing members of the opposing faction, eventually setting it on fire and shooting those who tried to escape. One of the most notable incidents was the killing of John Tunstall, whose death sparked the conflict. Billy the Kid, who worked for Tunstall, swore vengeance, saying, I'll take down every rotten scoundrel who helped kill John if it's the last thing I do. One of the most infamous lynchings of the era was that of John Heath in Tombstone, Arizona, in 1884. Heath was implicated in the Bisbee Massacre, where five men robbed a general store and killed four people. While Heath's accomplices were legally hanged, a mob decided Heath's 25-year prison sentence was too lenient. They broke into the jail, dragged Heath to a telegraph pole, and lynched him. His last words were reportedly, Boys, you are hanging an innocent man, and you will find it out before those other men are hung. I have one favour to ask, he continued, that you will not mutilate my body by shooting into it after I am hung. The mob honoured this last request. Interestingly, the telegraph pole used to hang Heath became a macabre tourist attraction, with people carving off pieces as souvenirs until the pole had to be replaced. The practice of vigilantism wasn't universally accepted, even in the Wild West. Some saw it as a necessary evil in lawless territories, while others viewed it as a dangerous precedent. Theodore Roosevelt, who spent time as a rancher in the Dakota Territory, expressed mixed feelings about vigilantism. He wrote, I do not like lynching. I do not like any substitution of illegal for legal procedure, but the spirit which makes a man a vigilante is fundamentally the spirit of orderly self-restraint and of devotion to the law. This ambivalence was shared by many frontier settlers who saw vigilantism as a temporary measure until formal law enforcement could be established. As the frontier became more settled and formal law enforcement structures were established, vigilantism began to wane. However, its impact on Western culture and American justice was profound. As one anonymous frontier saying went, there's no law west of Dodge, 
and no god west of the Pecos. In this lawless expanse, vigilantes filled the void, for better or worse, shaping the course of Western history with rope and gun. The impact of vigilantism extended beyond individual cases, influencing the development of formal law enforcement in the West. For instance, the Texas Rangers, formed in 1823, often blurred the line between lawmen and vigilantes in their early years. Captain Bill MacDonald of the Rangers famously quipped, No man in the wrong can stand up against a fellow that's in the right and keeps on a-coming, a sentiment that encapsulated both the determination and the potential for abuse inherent in frontier justice. As we close this chapter of history, let's reflect on the savage ingenuity of Wild West justice. From the sweltering hot box of Yuma Territorial Prison, where inmates were left to bake in the Arizona sun, to the notorious water cure of Texas, where prisoners were force-fed gallons of water until they nearly drowned, the frontier's punitive imagination knew no bounds. As we bid farewell to this grim saga, let's ponder the words of Judge Isaac Parker, the infamous hanging judge of Fort Smith, Arkansas, who sentenced 160 men to death between 1875 and 1896. He once mused, I never hanged a man, the law did. A cold comfort indeed for those who faced frontier justice. In the end, these brutal punishments serve as a stark reminder of how far we've come and how vigilant we must remain. For as Oscar Wilde wisely noted, the degree of civilization in a society can be judged by entering its prisons. By that measure, the Wild West was wild indeed. Until next time, may your trails be free of outlaws and your justice more tempered than a hangman's noose.